New research is changing everything we thought we knew about choline's impact on the cow and her calf, and top scientists have a lot to say about it. They are presenting new research that supports choline as a required nutrient to optimize milk production, choline as a required nutrient to support a healthy transition, choline as a required nutrient to improve calf health and growth, and choline as a required nutrient to increase colostrum quantity. This new research is solidifying choline's role as a required nutrient for essentially every cow, regardless of health status, milk production level, or body condition score. Learn more about the science that is changing the game and the choline source that is making it happen. Reassure Precision Release Choline from Balchem. Visit balchem.com slash scientists say to learn more. Delivering the perfect ration for the rumen microbes might be more important and more challenging than feeding the cow. Nitrisher, Precision Release Nitrogen, delivers a consistent supply of rumen-protected nitrogen to improve animal performance, maximize profitability, and minimize nitrogen excretion into the environment. With Nitrisher, you get improved fiber digestion, increased microbial protein production, and reduced dependence on expensive protein sources with a high carbon footprint. Feed the microbes that feed your cows with Nitrisher Precision Release Nitrogen from Balchem. Visit balchem.com to learn more. Hello everyone and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing at Balchem. Today, we welcome Dr. Kevin Duvetter to share his ideas for uh, maximizing farm profitability. Uh, Kevin Duvetter uh, is a technical consultant with Alanco Animal Health with responsibilities for providing technical support to U.S. dairy producers and key influencers on economic-related issues in the dairy industry. His primary focus is to analyze factors affecting profitability of dairy operations, developing decision tools, and analyzing herd health, production, and economic data. Prior to joining Alanco in 2014, Kevin had spent 27 years with Kansas State University working as an extension specialist and research econo economist where he focused on leasing and buying land, machinery costs, crop and livestock production economics, marketing, and technology adoption. Kevin received his uh, BS from North Dakota State University, his MS from Iowa State University, and his PhD uh, degree from Kansas State University, all in uh, agriculture economics. He and his wife now currently reside in Granville, Michigan. Dr. Duvetter, welcome. The floor is now yours. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Uh, pleasure to be here, and I will See if I can bring up my slides. Let me know if you're seeing them. Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, once again, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is some factors that affect dairy profitability. And then I'm going to have a couple examples of some custom analytics projects I did. One of my roles at Alanco here is to work with customers, work with influencers, nutritionists, veterinarians, um, helping people make decisions. So I'm going to share some things about what drives profitability. Much of this is things we've all heard. And then try to show how a couple of those might apply to um, a few little projects we've done as well. Just before I get started, I want to spend just a, one slide on some just terminology to kind of get us all on the same page as I throw out a lot of terms. Um, we've all heard of things probably like variable and fixed cost and why that concept is pretty important for an industry like dairy is that when an industry has what we might call fixed costs that's a strong incentive to scale up production to dilute those costs over more units of production so to the extent that dairy has a lot of fixed costs parlors people facilities equipment that's one of the reasons that really drives economies of scale okay then the other thing I want to talk about just briefly is short run versus long run. And I always jokingly say we really can't define it. But what I'm really commenting on when I say short run versus long run is 
Short run is that time where we really can't make big decisions, i.e., things are fixed, and therefore we're only focusing on what really changes day to day. So if we think of the short run, that might be today, that might be a month, might be six months. In the long run, whatever that is, it's something much, much longer. What I'm really saying there is everything on our dairy can change. And I jokingly say in the long run, well, we might all be dead, but at the same time, every single thing on my dairy could change over the next 50 years. And why that's important is in the short run, we make decisions on variable costs, but at the end of the day, we've got to pay all costs, okay? The next concept, um, cash versus economic costs. Um, I'm an economist, so I'm going to tend to talk about economic costs, which is going to be um, putting a value on everything. Cash costs is exactly like it sounds. It's those things that in the short run, I have to write a check for. I might not have to write a check for the land if I already own it free and clear, but long term, there is a cost associated with that asset. The next principle is one that uh, sometimes gets people a little bit frustrated, but basically Economics 101 says, in a competitive industry, and I would argue agriculture is competitive, on average, in the long run, profits are zero. Now, once again, when I define profits, I'm bringing in all the economic costs. So I'm saying in the long run, I might get some return to my labor and some return for my assets, but there's truly no profit above and beyond that, on average. The other, the next couple principles are some things I'm going to actually talk about a little bit more with a couple examples I'll show and some tools. Um, kind of marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. That says, so long as what I do, the income associated with it is greater than the cost incurred, I should go ahead and do that to maximize profit. And oftentimes we make this marginal revenue versus marginal cost decision, kind of looking at a partial budget type framework. I'll hit just a couple examples on that. And then finally, I'm not going to really spend any time on these last two points um, other than to just say that the dairy industry also follows along some of these things of comparative advantage, reveal preference, things of like that. And, and it might come up and might not, but uh, I'm not going to focus on those. Okay, so just getting into sharing a bunch of slides now with some data to kind of talk through some of these principles and how they do or don't apply. This is just the average prices of of milk in the U.S. going back to 2001. And what you can see right here is this makes it very, very clear that price doesn't equal cost in the short run. We see prices vary considerably over a five-year time period. For example, from 2016 to 2020, prices might have averaged $17.40, but they were above uh, $19, 13% of the time, below 15, 15% of time. So there's a lot of variation. And obviously, price doesn't equal cost because costs don't change that much day to day. So once again, remember when I say price equals cost, that's kind of a long-term on average phenomenon. Uh, one thing we can see is variation has significantly increased. Why is this important? You know, there's a couple ways we manage risk. One is we manage price risk with risk management type tools. But the other way we manage risk is through our use of maybe a little bit lower debt, a little less leverage, and also by maintaining the lowest cost structure we can. So I would argue that um, risk management is very critical. But when I say that, I'm not necessarily talking about um, market tools like futures options, um, the, the various risk management tools we have. I'm talking about just managing our business as a whole. Just real quick, what the futures market's telling us as of last week, um, prices for 2024 uh, at the U.S. average is going to be around $21, um, which is right in line with where it's been for the last three years. The good news is I think we'll get a little bit of break on feed. So even though the price these last few years has not been you know, really great to cover all of our costs, uh, hopefully feed will go down. So here's a, a slide showing USDA data, ERS data, so 2020 to 2022. This is survey-based data. So this is not actual farm level data. It's survey-based data. And then with some assumptions that assumes what unpaid labor would be worth given the region it's in. What you can see here is based on a three-year average, there's really only a couple places in the country where the value of production exceeded the cost. Okay, we've got quite a bit of 
places where the, the value production is below the total cost. The other thing to point out on this slide is we know that one of our biggest costs is feed. And feed in this case ranged from about $11 at, at a low from the southern seaboard region to a high of $12.91 in the Prairie Gateway. So about a $1.90 difference between the, the lowest and the highest region. Clearly, we've got more than a $1.90 swing in some of our other costs. So while feed cost is an important cost, what really differentiates some of those you know, successful operations from less is not necessarily feed costs, it's some of those non-feed costs. Here's just some of that same information, except it's shown not by region, it's shown here's kind of a national average um, over time. This one's a little disheartening. This one says, well, wait a minute, there's only been about two or three months um, or years going back to 2000 when we actually had what we would call an economic profit. Remember, economic profit says all costs have been covered, return to labor, return to all assets. That almost never happens. And I would argue that we've actually have very, you know, some people would look at this graph and say, uh, Kevin, I don't believe you, this, this can't be right. I would argue we actually have very good evidence that this probably is true. And that evidence is this next slide. This next slide says, if we go all the way back to 1965 and look at the number of farms year over year, they just consistently keep going down. Well, if we are consistently making money, people would not be leaving the industry. We've had fewer and fewer farms every single year, and average right at about a 6% drop year over year over this whole time period. So that's a pretty good indication that on average, we probably aren't making a lot of money. Otherwise, I just don't believe people will be leaving the industry, okay? So now I'm just going to switch and, and, and try to apply some of these to some actual data, and it's from different sources. I'm going to go through it pretty quick just to kind of give you some high-level pictures of things. This first data is some data from back in my days at Kansas State University. There's what we have a, it's called an enterprise dairy report. I'm not going to get into all the details right now, but just show some high-level things. This graph is one of my favorite graphs to show because it really drives out some key things about an industry like dairy, but it could be crop farming, could be a lot of industries. So we went the first 20 years here over this time period, going all the way back to 1989, where the average profit, and in this case, profit is truly economic profit. In the Kansas Farm Management Association, costs are assigned to everything, unpaid labor, owned land, machinery, everything. This is exactly what, as an economist, I would expect. Average profits close to zero. Some years we make some positive money, some years we lose, but on average, we're very close to zero. But then we went 14 years in a row where 13 of those years we lost money. So here's when someone might come back to me and say, okay, Kevin, you said in the long run, on average, profits are zero. What the heck is going on? We've got 30 some years here, and it's clearly not averaging zero. Well, I think what's going on is um, people are staying in business because they're covering variable costs. Very seldom did they cover their total costs. And that, that's what I just showed you on the last graph. So we're covering variable costs. So I stay in business for now, but that's not sustainable long-term. And here's what's really explaining it more than anything. This is the, the gray bars are farm size. And in this early 20 years, we were 100 cows or so on average. And to be honest, that was not, that was almost a typical size farm for a lot of places in the country back then. But then going forward, the dairy started growing, but they were not keeping up with the industry. They might have been growing and now they're 200 cows, but the reality is, is this has got left behind by the industry. So the point of this one is, yes, on average, profits are zero, but if the industry is changing rapidly and I'm not keeping up with it, they're not going to be zero for me. I've got to keep up with the industry if, when the industry is undergoing some big changes. Some other data I want to share real quick, and I'm going to go through this fairly quick, but because it's from a, a number of sources. I've got data from California. I've got data from Genske and Mulder, an accounting firm from multiple states. I've got data from University of Minnesota FinBin program, which is kind of Minnesota, Wisconsin, 
Cornell data, Nitsky and Popple, another accounting firm, and then another little study that I did when I was at Kent State, so a shorter term data. But the point of this is universities, government agencies, accounting firms, multiple sources, multiple regions, um, different methodologies, just a lot of data from a lot of sources. Just before I show all of it, I want to just walk through the Nitsky and Popple and kind of show you how I looked at it. So Nitsky and Popple is an accounting firm. They'll report things for the top 30% versus the average by year. Here's just the data from 2001 to 2020. And what you can see is when you sort data by profitability, top 30, by definition, they're going to do better than the average. I mean, that's just a mathematical definition. But you can see that it's a pretty big difference. You can also see that the range, the difference from the high year to the low year, is very similar for both groups. And then finally, if I know what the income is for everybody or the profit and the top 30, I can actually calculate what's the 20 year average for the bottom 70. And you can see it's slightly above zero, but at least it is a positive number on average. But you know that this bottom 70% probably had a number of years where they were in the red. So just a couple of graphs from them because I'm going to summarize all those other data sources in a similar way. On average, the top 30% tend to be larger. Um, in the really, really bad years, they're actually smaller. That makes sense. If things are really, really bad, um, the best thing I can do is not milk any cows. But on average, the larger, the more successful farms tend to be larger, uh, tend to have slightly lower costs. Their feed costs aren't much different. And they also tend to make a little bit more milk per cow. Okay. So the top 30%, they're larger, a little bit more productive, generally have lower costs per cow and then a little bit per hundred weight. Feed costs don't vary a ton. Okay, so now I'm gonna just show the summary of these other data sources. So once again, Cornell, 18 years, top 20 versus average. Nitsky and Popple, I've already shown you this, top 30 versus others. California doesn't have a high and low profit. They sorted them by farm size. K-State's the top third versus everybody. Genski and Mulder, top 25 versus everybody, three different states. And then this Finn Ben group, top 20 versus everybody from kind of Minnesota, Wisconsin. And in most cases, 18 to 20 years of data with a couple exceptions. So a few points real quick. When you sort people, producers, operations by profitability, by definition, the people at the top of the list make more money. I mean, I'm, that, that's just saying that's just how sorting works, right? But the point of it is, that the difference between that top 20 and that top 30 versus everybody else is quite large. So what that really means is today, when I look out there and I see 10 different dairy farms, the difference between their, their profitability can vary substantially, even though they're all operating in the same market conditions. So a lot of variation between operations. That's absolutely great news for individual farms because that says management matters. It's not just we're all the same. We can do things different. It obviously is not so good if you're at the bottom end of that. Next thing real quick, the range. And the range, once again, is just defined as the variation from the good year to the worst year. If you sat and stared at this, what it really is just basically saying is when you're in the top group, you're not immune from market highs and lows. We've got, we experience the same kind of variability as everyone else. Herd size, um, on average, except, except the fin bin data, in all cases, the more per prop, profitable group tended to be larger, not necessarily way larger, but tended to be larger. They made more milk. I'm not talking 10 pounds of milk, but I'm talking consistently one, three, four pounds of milk more. Um, so that helps. They tend to have lower costs. Their feed costs per cow, and I'm going through this fast, Sometimes higher, sometimes lower, but not, not necessarily always lower. And then finally, culling, annual replacement, removals, however we want to call it. If you sat and stared at this, there's not a strong relationship here. Okay. And I'm going to hit a couple of these points in a little bit. Just a couple more data sources, then we'll move on to, from something else. So here was something that Kevin Bernhardt had published in Progressive Dairy in the Ag Crowd newsletter, um, showing data from University of Wisconsin from 2014 and 18, where he sorted based on return on assets in the University of Minnesota, different five-year time periods, so two different five-year time periods, and that data was sorted on net returns. If you sat and stared at all these numbers, here's the gist of it. 
those people in the high profit group, and in this case, it was defined as the top 40 versus the middle 20 and the low 40, the high profit tended to get a higher price. I don't know if it's because they're better price pickers or because they're producing a product that brings more premiums. They have higher cost per cow per year. Say that again. High profit farms have higher cost per cow per year. They're more productive, and because they're more productive, they have a significantly lower cost per hundredweight. One last data source um, from Yost and Beck from Penn, Penn State. They did a, a thing where they looked at profitability groups in, in 20 percentiles, um, and what they said is those people that had a higher percent of home-raised feed tended to be less profitable. I love this slide because it meets one of my biases. So I'm just being honest here, it meets one of my biases. I'll talk to some people and they'll say, well, if we just had more of our own feed, we'd make more money. Well, at the end of the day, what makes you money is having good quality feed that makes that's very efficient in converting feed into milk. And if you can do that with your own, that's fantastic. But if you can't do it with your own, you might be better off to buy more feed. So like I said, it's not the whether it was home raised or not that makes the big difference. It's how effective and efficient I am at converting feed into milk. So this, like I said, it meets my bias only because I want to say, you know, I think it's, what's most important is productivity, not necessarily home raised versus purchase. So I went through a lot of information there, but if I summarized it, just some obvious things. There's a huge difference between the top groups and the average, okay? Um, and, and like I said, the good news of that is what that means is management matters. Not everyone out there is the same. I can differentiate myself from other people, and there's a lot of data that backs that up, says there's big differences. As a general rule, those that are in the top profitability group, they have lower costs because they're using a lot of fixed assets more efficiently. Fixed assets, that's going to be parlor, barns. So that says get more cows through my facilities, but a cow herself becomes fixed once she's on the farm. So they're getting more milk per cow. So I'm doing a better job of being efficient with both my facilities, but also my cows. Feed cost per cow is not a good indicator. Um, and I, I know we still a lot of times throw that out as a benchmark. What's your feed cost per cow per day? It's a terrible benchmark. It doesn't really tell us a whole lot. It's useful only for me comparing myself to myself over time, possibly still might not even be very good for that. And then finally, herd replacements or cull rate is not a good indicator of profitability. We can find farms that have very high cull rates that are very profitable. We can find farms that have very low cull rates that are also very profitable. So um, we have to know what else is going on. So now kind of moving away from just some of that data and, and, and talking about what's driving some of this a little bit more. Keeping things pretty simple is, let's just say that profit is simply revenue minus costs, okay? We know what revenue is, it's, it's calves, it's milk, it's the coal cows we sell, things like that. Cost is pretty straightforward, it's feed, labor, energy, overhead. We typically assume that the goal is profit max. I completely understand that isn't everybody's individual goal. Now, once someone tells me that their goal is not profit maximization, it's a little bit harder for me to, to advise them as to what they should do because I can talk dollars, and, and once dollars isn't what we're really talking about, it, it's a little harder to decide what's the best thing to do. But so let's assume that we want to increase profit. We want to maximize profit. So humor me and, and let's all be profit maximizers for the rest of the day. If we want to increase profit, well, how do we do that? Well, basically, it's just a mathematical equation, so there's really about three ways we do it. We can increase revenue, i.e. the green part, and or decrease cost, or we can increase revenue more than costs might go up. And finally, we can decrease revenue, but hopefully less than costs go down. Now, I said I've spent 27 years at Kansas State working with a lot of producers, not necessarily dairy, um, beef producers, crop farmers, and my experiences are when we get in this mode three, I tend to think that's the spiral down. When we start trying to save ourselves 
to prosperity, we really run into problems. Now, I'm not naive enough. I'm not so naive to not realize that there's times that's what we have to do. When times are really, really tight, we might have to do some drastic things to cut costs, and we know that they're going to affect revenue and, and drop revenue. But as a general rule, very seldom would a strategy of increasing profit by trying to save ourselves with big cost decreases um, be successful, at least in my experiences um, in people I've worked with. So these changes we might make, we're going to just, I'm going to call them incremental or marginal. So remember, I talked earlier about marginal revenue greater than marginal cost, okay? So marginal revenue, I'm hoping my increased revenue goes up by my marginal cost, okay? So that's kind of how I'm talking about um, one of those factors. So when we think about this incremental or this marginal milk, um, it typically is profitable. And I think the reason we all know it probably is profitable is it gets back to fixed costs. There's a lot of fixed costs in the industry. Okay, so the reason, like I said, it's typically because the, the in, incremental income is better than incremental costs. Well, how's it done? One, adding cows. Let's put a few more cows in our barns, get a few more cows through the parlor. But sometimes we can't do any more there, or we've taken that up to the rate of diminishing returns. So then the next thing is, is can I increase the production from each existing cow? Well, which is more beneficial? I can't tell you that there's a right answer for everybody. It really depends on what your individual dairy's constraints are. So here's, once again, some more of that um, USDA or ERS data that shows that five-year average of 2018 to 22 milk cost of production, where the graph on the left is sorting it by output per cow. And the graph on the right is it's the same data, but here it's sorting it by number of cows on the farm. Recognize that I'm excluding any cow farms with less than 100 cows. If I included those really, really small farms, the graph on the right would shoot way up um, really extremely high. But what you can see is in both cases, as I have either more milk per cow or more cows per farm, my costs tend to go down. With regards to farm size, there's some pretty big benefits for a while, but once I get out to this six, 700, 1,000, 1,200 cows, you know, the, the benefit of getting larger becomes smaller and smaller. The graph on the left is pretty darn linear. It says, as I have more milk per cow, my cost per cow or per hundred weight of milk goes down and it's pretty much in a linear sort of fashion. So what is the cost of trying to get this incremental milk? Well, the one obvious thing is, is if I make more milk, I've got to probably feed more feed and water to make sure I can take those, the energy and nutrients required to make that milk. Obviously, if I have more milk, whether I'm talking about more milk on my dairy or more milk per cow, I've got to haul it away. I've got the marketing promotion and all those costs. So that part's very straightforward, nothing too challenging there. But other than that, it now gets really complicated because it just depends on how we might do this. I might work with one producer that says, all we're doing is just going to do a better job of doing things right. We're going to make sure we're following protocols and procedures, not having protocol drift. We're just going to do all the little things right. Well, surely that probably has some cost, but maybe not a lot of cost. That's completely different than someone that's going out and putting in new facilities and, and adding barn space. So the incremental cost, of changing things really is gonna vary from herd to herd. And there's no one answer that says this is what it always is. So when we think about, well, what should I do? Obviously we gotta start somewhere. I'm an economist by training. We, we build budgets, we build tools. So I'm gonna say we need to start with some kind of partial budget. Partial budget is, is, is pretty simple. It's got four parts. It says, if I do this, whatever this is, this change, What's going to happen to revenue? Is it going to go up or down? And what's going to happen to costs? Are they going to go down or are they going to go up? I look at my increased revenue and decreased costs. And that's the benefit. I look at potentially reduced revenue and increased costs, and that's my total cost. Once I identify those four things, it's pretty straightforward. We can then dimension it a lot of ways. We can put it as net returns, dollar per farm, dollar per head per day, dollar per hundred weight. We can calculate break-evens, we can calculate ROIs, we can cal calculate payback. So a partial budget looks pretty simple. 
once we've got the numbers nailed down, we can do a lot with it. Here's an extremely simplified partial budget. Scenario A says, I'm feeding something that, that costs 14 cents per pound of dry matter. My cows take 20 pounds a day just for maintenance, and then they require another 0.4 pounds for every pound of milk, or they get two and a half pounds of milk for every one pound of feed. I can throw in a milk price, non-feed costs. I can do all the math. It says, if I was getting 88 pounds of milk, that would cost me $7.73 per head per day for feed. And my profit on that day, given some milk price, non-feed costs, would be 55 cents. Scenario B says, hey, can, would it make sense for me to do something, some additive, some supplement, something that might increase my cost a half a cent per pound of dry matter. So instead of 14, it's 14 and a half cents. We're still gonna take that same kind of feed requirements, go through all the math, and we're gonna say, hey, in this case here, if I'm just gonna compare profit, 55 is roughly equal to 53. So it says, in order for me to justify this little bit higher feed cost, yeah, in this case, I need to pick up two pounds of milk. But keep in mind, if I pick up this two pounds of milk and I basically break even, I did spend more cost per head per day. Once again, if my goal is to minimize cost per head per day, that might be leaving some profit opportunities on the table. If I could get three pounds, I'm gonna be increasing my profit, but clearly I'm spending more cost per day. So once again, cost per cow per day for feed is probably not a metric we should think about or focus on too much. Not gonna go into this one real detail, but this is an example of a partial budget, a, a spreadsheet model I built specifically for a customer that said, hey, I'm, I'm looking at adding stalls so that I can reduce my stocking rate because I feel like I'm at about 130%. I'd like to drop that down. So we built a spreadsheet that would allow him to look at increased revenue, decreased costs, so same things we talked about. You can tell I didn't do this yesterday because at that time we had a $2,500 for added stall. I think today, unfortunately, would be a lot higher than that. But then we could go through with the assumptions. And when all was said and done, we could calculate what's this going to do profit for me? What kind of milk price or milk yield do I need to break even? What's my payback? What kind of ROI do I got? So once again, we identify a few things. We put it in a partial budget framework and we can get a lot of useful out. But it can also get a lot more complicated than that. Uh, so here's not a partial budget anymore. This is kind of more of a whole farm budget. And we might say, well, I'm thinking of doing something that might allow me to increase my cow numbers or change my milk per cow. So technically I've got to go through every category on my, on my expenses and say, is this impacted when I change cows, when I change milk per cow, yes or no? So for example, it might say, well, the milk production, if I add cows, I don't know. It, it might go up, might go down. So I've got to identify all these things in red. Those that are fixed, they're easy. It says no change. Okay. But what I'm really getting at here is while this is kind of a partial budget, it also says, the, yeah, they can be pretty simple like that feed example I gave or a little more complicated like the other one, or they can start getting quite complex. This is a screen capture, and I realize there's a lot of numbers on here, and the point isn't to actually show every number. It's to say this is a framework of something I built actually when COVID hit. When COVID hit, we had a lot of people all of a sudden faced with um, quotas that they weren't, they hadn't had the experience before. All of a sudden, they, their, their buyers were saying, we don't know if we want to take as much milk. So I put something together that was could help people make decisions where you would put in a very whole farm approach, you'd kind of say, here's my cost, trying to follow a, almost an accountant style type of cost. Once I add in all my costs for dairy, I can calculate what it is per cow, what it is per hundred weight. And then I said, what if I increase my milk per cow from 85 pounds to 87? So there's some inputs that you're not seeing on the screen where I put in a few more assumptions down below, but you can't see them. But then when I do that, I have to go through all my costs and say, is this fixed or is it variable or is it maybe some combination of the two? So as an example, on this dairy, this, I mean, it's a hypothetical dairy, but it's based on some real numbers. This dairy, this size would be spending about $765,000 on labor. 
They said, well, when I go in and try to get some more milk, um, I'm actually not, that's not going to affect my labor. So it's 100% fixed, okay? On the other hand, things like supplies, that might be, um, it might vary, okay? So I can have some combination. So in this example, I went in and I said, what if I added two pounds of milk uh, and I added, uh, so my profit went from 168 or my, my profit, my income less cost, whatever we want to call it. By getting that extra two pounds of milk, I increased my profit or my return 163,000. So I about doubled what I was before. However, I did have to spend more money to do it. Once again, I made more money, but I had to spend more money. Okay. And most of that spent more money was on things like feed because you don't get extra feed for free. I could use this same spreadsheet to say, well, what instead if I actually got added a few cows? So in this case, I went from 1,200 milk cows to 1,300. I actually dropped my milk a little bit because I said, yeah, I might be putting a little bit of pressure on some pens. Maybe I'll drop milk. And in this case, we see that going slightly down in milk, but with more cows, actually had about the exact same effect on my bottom line. I picked up about 170,000, but in this case, I actually had to spend quite a bit more money because I was buying some more cows. So I share this simply to say, these are the kind of tools we can do. And most of the time, I'm gonna say that increasing milk, whether it's through more cows or more milk per cow, most of the time that pays because we're diluting fixed costs. Okay, so now I want to actually walk to two quick examples of some things I did where we kind of apply some of this to some real world situations. This first one was a, a question that came to me and said, this is basically the email I got. It said, I would like to look at if there's any milk loss with cows when they move from a high cow diet to a maintenance cow diet. And then they gave me some information about pens and I looked through all this and they, at the end of the day, they said, well, you could probably ignore the first lactation animals because, you know, they're not really relevant. But this is, if anybody has done any analysis around pen moves, this is the kind of world we have to live in, right? Not the best quality data. This is not a design experiment. This is just, can you help me look at what's going on on my farm? So it's, it's, it's very messy. Uh, things are moving. Uh, changes aren't always the exact same. So we do the best job we can. and, and try to make decisions from it. So what I did, um, I pulled out all the move data and I cleaned it up and I said, okay, I'm looking at moves that went from a certain pan to a certain pan within a certain days and milk window. And when it was all said and done, I had a subset of cows that I could look at. And once again, this is just some screen captures and spreadsheets. So what I did is I said, I'm going to try to look at this kind of, this this dairy had daily milk, so we basically could kind of look at a lactation curve. So I'm going to use that information to try to make a decision. And here's here's how I'm doing it. So this is not the dairy. This is just a hypothetical lactation curve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if they're targeting a pen move at 210 days, I'm going to back up and I'm going to look at the milk 35 to 21 days prior to that and going to compare that, point A, to the milk 14 days prior or within a two week window prior. And I'm gonna compare point A to point B. And we know that post peak, this isn't perfect, but we know post peak lactation curves are fairly linear. So I'm basically gonna look at this slope. I'm gonna just say how much was milk dropping from point A to point B on a daily basis. And then I'm gonna compare it to the 14 days after the move versus the, after the move 21 to 35 days. So I'm basically going to compare the slope here with the slope here. The only difference is, is when I've got all these cows, this 1,500 cows, sometimes they moved at 210 days, sometimes they moved at 120, sometimes they moved at 280. So I'm always taking it relative to when they got moved into this other pen. So here's the summary of what I did on this dairy. And there's a lot of numbers here, but here's the general point. The parity weighted average slope was 0.17 pounds to the left of the move, i.e. prior to the move. What that says is cows were dropping 0.171 pounds per day. That was their persistency. 
after the move, they were dropping almost a quarter of a pound per day. So what we'd see is back to this graph, here we're dropping about 0.17. After we moved, we started dropping at a faster rate. Then I can come in and do some math around that and say, if I had roughly 110 days from the day I moved till the end of my lactation, how much milk would I lose if I had a slope of 0.17 versus a slope of 0.245? Okay, remember these cows are all pregnant, so once the slope is not affecting how long the lactation is, or it's just, it's, the move is only affecting the slope, not the length of this curve. And without getting into all the numbers here, at the end of the day, what I found is yes, you're losing milk and you're probably losing 450 some pounds of milk or more by making that pen move. But I didn't know exactly how they were changing the diet. So what I could do is back calculate and say, to justify giving up this milk, I better have saved about one cent per pound of dry matter uh, to make that pay. If my feed costs were not going down by that much, I'd be better off to have higher milk. If my feed costs were dropping more than one cent per pound dry matter, I can go ahead and give up milk. So this goes against what I typically say. I typically say, don't try to save yourself to prosperity. But in this post-lactation, post-peak lactation, we also know we might not need to spend money on some feed additives, some supplements that we might definitely need earlier in the lactation. So it's just something we have to evaluate. Real quick, I think it was several months back or last fall, um, Dr. Alex Bach actually gave a webinar on the same, uh, with the same group here. And he presented a paper where he had done something probably a lot more uh, detailed than what I did. He basically had three herds with data from six different pen move scenarios. And he looked at whether or not that helped. And what he found was uh, out of those six scenarios, four of them would have been profitable, even though they were giving up milk, two of them would have been unprofitable. So the point of this pen move thing is not to say that we should move cows and save costs. It just says we all have to look at it individually. Going back to one of the principles, a lot of variation from herd to herd. Don't just do what your neighbor does. Make sure it makes sense for you. There's a great opportunity to manage my herd and make money. Okay, so I said incremental milk is often profitable, but there might be times when actually less milk is the right thing to do. I also have to point out that I recognize changing diets, changing um, what cows are eating late in lactation. There's potentially other implications just more than just milk, right? There's body condition. There's other things we have to account for. So one last thing here, I'll try to go through here in the next, you know, five to ten minutes. I haven't really talked about heifers, and, and that's because this talk wasn't necessarily about them. But this is some data that Cornell put out a few years back, actually in 2019, where they went out and they surveyed very in-depth 26 operations, did their best to include full economic costs, you know, including non-labor or unpaid labor, including everything. And what they came away from was they said the average cost of raising a replacement heifer was about $2,350. The bottom 10% were down around 2,000. The top 10% were at 2,600. So unfortunately, and I've, I've been guilty of this myself plenty of times, we, we look at a benchmark and we say, well, if the average is 2,300, it's probably good to be at 2,200. That's not probably a good thing to say because we don't know, right? It might be that spending $2,500 is way better than spending 2,100, depending on how we raise our heifers. So I think this is great information to get us start thinking, but we've got to take it a little bit further. And so with that, I want to tie this back a little bit to another question that came to me from a producer. This was a producer that was weighing cows, and they wanted to know how the weight at first lactation was impacting specifically milk, but also did it have any impact on early removals and reproduction in that first lactation? Won't go into all the details, but so as an example, this is data from the herd I was looking at. So 4,000 first lactation animals over a three year time period, roughly. Okay, so what we can see is a lot of variation over time. And this line is pretty flat. It's technically trending down just a little bit, but for the most part, 
weights haven't changed over the last three years on this dairy, but there is a lot of variation at any given time. So I took this, this data and I sorted it out a little bit, bit differently. I put it into a scatter chart where I put the weight at calving on the y-axis, the age at calving on the x-axis, and then these blue grid lines or crosshairs, those are the medians. So that basically says half the observations are above this, half are below, half with regard to age are to the left of the vertical line, and half are to the right. The red line is just a simple linear trend. I always jokingly say it's really nice to see that it's upward sloping because that just says when cows get older, they get bigger. That's all it says. But you can also see real quick from that red line that there's a lot of variation around that. So in other words, age helps explain weight, but there's a lot of other things going on. And we all know that, right? Health, um, nutrition, whatnot. But once again, this is from one dairy. Okay. So if we think about these four quadrants, the lower left, there's 29% of the cows fell down here. This says these are cows that weighed below the mean or the median, but they were also younger than the median. In the upper right are those that were heavier, but they were older. If age explained weight perfectly, every dot would fall on a line that would go through these two grids, right? There would be no, no data points in grid two or grid four if age perfectly explained weight, okay? So what's quadrant two? Well, quadrant two is those animals that actually weighed better than the average and they were younger, probably gained really well, they probably weren't sick, things like that. And then of course, the ones that we're all probably most concerned about is 21% of the animals down here at calving are lighter than average, but they're the older than average. So these are the ones we really want to know a little bit more about. So what I did is I, I estimated some models for some regression models for milk. I looked at milk at tests one, two, and three. I'm going to mostly talk about peak milk. Then I also did some logistic models for removal in the first 60 days versus first service outcome. Not going to spend a lot on that. What did I put in my model? All I'll say is the, the typical things that we would consider in a lot of models, um, whether they had disease, age, age squared, things like that seasonality. And here's the take home point of this. So what I've done is I've put in the average age and weight at that quadrant. And then I evaluated test one and test two milk. But let's focus on peak milk at, with, from, from my model. So what this says is an animal in this quadrant one that weighed 660 or 1178 pounds at 663 days of age. So lighter than average, younger than average would have given me about 85 pounds of milk at peak. Go to quadrant three, which is my older animals that weighed more. So there's 719 days, 1,386 pounds, so almost 200 pounds more. They're giving me six pounds more milk at peak, okay? And then it's these fourth quadrant, or these quadrant four animals. They're old, so they cost a lot to raise in the sense that it took an extra... 45 days to get them to the same weight as those in quadrant one. And they're giving me about 86 pounds of milk. So back to the question is, how does it, how is weight affecting it? Um, heavy animals are definitely good. But I think what this helped me more than anything was not saying heavy animals are good. It's like, we have a lot of animals, 21% that are falling in this quadrant four that we've got to try to figure them out and figure out ways to quit making them because likely they are not going to be the successful ones in our herd. They cost more to raise because of the age, and then they, because they're light, they just don't milk as well. So the next step on this, and I'm working on some follow-up projects, is to say, can we identify these cows earlier on in the heifer raising program? So just to kind of wrap up the comments about the, the weight. Um, the weighted cow, and I've, I've done this similar analysis with a and three herds now at the moment, those three that I know that I've worked with where people had waste. Uh, the cow, I mean, that's a very important uh, variable in explaining milk production. Um, much more important than the age, but in this case, older animals also was associated with more milk, but older animals that weighed a lot was the best. This considerable variation exists. 
So backing up, there's four to 500 pounds variation at any given age. Part of that's gonna be measurement error, I get that. We're, we're weighing things on the farm, so part of it's measurement error, but a lot of that's just other things going on. This is one herd, so I have to believe the genetics are fairly common, so you have to believe a lot of that has to do with some health events early on, and still there's no question, still some genetic um, factors going on as well. But that, that four to 500 pound range is extremely large. So what we want to be able to do is identify those cows that are lighter than average, but older, because I think that's what'll help us. If we can figure out ways to quit making that type of cow, we will raise the bar for our entire herd. And it might very well be that's what puts us in that top 20%, that top 30%. But of course this requires weighing cows and not everybody's doing that, right? So just the last couple summary points to kind of wrap things up here. Um, there's a wide range of profitability across the areas. I showed data from a lot of places that back that up. That shouldn't surprise anybody. I mean, we all know there's variation. I guess maybe we don't always realize just how much variation there is. Um, but once again, I think that's great because what that means is management matters. I don't wanna be a manager in an operation or in a business where everybody's the same because economics principles would say, if that's the case, profits will go down, rates of return to the assets in that kind of industry will go down because there's just not risk. So the fact that there's a lot of variation can be viewed as a good thing, um, but it also means that there's gonna be some people that go out of business. Incremental milk is often profitable due to the dilution of fixed costs. The dairy industry has a lot of costs that are fixed in the short run. And therefore, when I can get more milk per milker, more milk per stall in my barn, things like that. That helps dilute those costs. And what it means is more often than not, the, the revenue associated is greater than marginal costs. But I then did show you an example where maybe it pays to take less milk at the end of lactation if I truly can't have big enough cost savings. So the strategies for minimizing fixed costs per unit of output are to get more cows through the facilities and get more milk per cow. Clearly, we have a lot of people in this industry that have done a great job of doing both. Sometimes all I can do is focus on number two because of where I'm at, I'm landlocked, I'm constrained by uh, manure management or whatever environmental things, and I can't have more cows. I, I, this is all the cows I can get through, so I have to focus on bullet number two. But we've got some people that have done a great job of doing both. I'm not gonna say one is more profitable than the other because it really just depends on what your constraints are. I also would say that supply control and quotas also affect the incremental milk. So I can sit here and preach that generally more milk is a good thing, but once we come into a quota type system or some kind of supply control, that changes the dynamics obviously. And we all face that when, when COVID came and a lot of people were faced with some short-term supply control. And finally, uh, the market variability, both input and out price, is very high. It's not going to probably go away anytime soon. We do know that the inflation and interest rates, the increases we saw in them from 2000 to, say, 2023, probably tacked on almost $1,000 of cost to a cow on an annual basis. That's a huge impact. Uh, yeah, they might be tempered back a little bit. But the reality is, is we're going to be faced with some of these high, high costs. Feed costs might go down a little, but a lot of the other things that inflation and interest rates have hit um, are still high. In a commodity market, and for the most part, I'm going to argue that most all of us in the dairy industry would be in a commodity market. We're not all selling some kind of niche product. Being the low cost for unit of production is critical for business survival. Critical for business survival to be a low per unit of production. Sometimes the best way to lower my cost per unit of production is to spend more money per cow per day because the marginal revenue, the marginal productivity is greater than the marginal cost. So we should always be thinking about per unit of production, not cost per cow per day. And I already made this comment, inflation is increasing significantly in the last several years as of interest rates. So one big thing about where stuff going that I don't know. Um, but remember, in a changing industry, 
if I don't keep up, I fall behind. I showed you herds that went from 100 cows to 200 cows that went from breaking even to losing money consistently because they weren't growing as fast as the industry as a whole. Well, there's some things going on right now with regards to beef and dairy, carbon markets. None of us really know for sure where it's going, but as some of these things really develop, you know, I've got to probably keep up with the industry or else I risk falling behind. So with that, um, that's all I have, Scott, and uh, be glad to open it up for any questions people might have. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Duvetter. Uh, before we get started answering the questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. New research is changing everything we thought we knew about choline's impact on the cow and her calf, and top scientists have a lot to say about it. They are presenting new research that supports choline as a required nutrient to optimize milk production, choline as a required nutrient to support a healthy transition, choline as a required nutrient to improve calf health and growth, and choline as a required nutrient to increase colostrum quantity. This new research is solidifying choline's role as a required nutrient for essentially every cow, regardless of health status, milk production level, or body condition score. Learn more about the science that is changing the game and the choline source that is making it happen. Reassure Precision Release Choline from Balchem. Visit balchem.com slash scientists say to learn more. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab on your control panel. Uh, Dr. Duvetter, your first question comes in from Ahmed. Uh, he'd like to know how to calculate the value of, of a heifer uh, from day one of age. From day one of age. I, okay. I, yeah. So, uh, clarification, are we asking for the value of the heifer on day one or to calculate? Maybe, the maybe it is the cost? The, for the whole time value, value of heifer uh, one day age. Okay. So may yeah. Um, I'll answer that question with a quick little story. Um, I gave a presentation this last fall down in Mexico, and I kept talking about the value of wet calves. And finally, I realized they had no idea what I was talking about because they kept saying, how do you value a calf on day one? I said, well, there's a market for them. And then I realized, no, in their area, there was not a market for them. Hmm. There's no market. And so in the U.S., you know, in that sense, we're a little bit spoiled because we generally have a, a market, right? So what determines the value on day one is we have people buying and selling day old calves. In other places in the, in some places in the country, in some places in the world, there is no market. I don't have a real good answer on how to do that, to be honest. Uh, I, I could help someone build a thing, but it's going to be a pretty complicated calculator what you do it because you have to make assumptions about where to allocate costs but I, unfortunately i don't have a real good answer on how you do that in the absence of a market all right speaking of calculators if someone in the audience wanted to use some of your your calculators or spreadsheets would you make those available so the one that i showed that has to do with the uh, that i said i really developed in the quota system to adding cows yes i've made that available for other people I typically have said I prefer if I could at least explain to you or show you how it works rather than just send it to you just because it's there's no documentation. Um, but I have definitely shared that with people and I'm willing to do that. Uh, the one specifically about adding the stall that was so tailored to that operation that probably wouldn't make sense to share it with people. All right. Very well. Cheryl is asking, uh, in studies uh, Zoetis Compure conducted, the replacement portion became highly related to farm income. On your economic studies, did you consider the value of the removals or the percent deads or involuntary calls versus voluntary calls to break that out more? In all your work, did you look at uh, energy corrected milk or just milk? Okay, so first of all, all of my work is very seldom my work. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm stealing from others. Um, so I, I'm relying on how Cornell did it or how Get, Get, Genske and Mulder did it, how Nitsky and Popple did it. So I'm using what they did. So 
I'll come back to the removal one in a second. The first one is, did we ever do it on energy corrected milk? Almost every one of those things looks at milk. And I know that that's a weakness for most of the people in the US. We should always be evaluating things per unit of energy corrected milk. I also know though that energy corrected milk and milk go hand in hand fairly well, not perfect, but so I think there's, I'm not going to apologize that a lot of this stuff was based on milk because the conclusions would be drastically different with energy correct milk. Now, back to the other question. Everybody has their own way of how they define um, culling rate, removal, whatever you want to call it, replacement costs. And that's kind of the beauty of that study is it was kind of brute force, a lot of data, a lot of sources, everybody looking at it a little different. And the conclusions came back and said, there's not a real strong conclusion that says low call rates are good or high or low call rates are bad. So the answer is, did I include everything? It was done a lot of different ways, however the group defined it. All right, very well. Jim is asking in uh, the early analysis of factors that impact profitability, can you assess debt and interest as a factor that separates operations? I, I can't with this data because I don't have access to the kind of data I need, but I will share a quick, this is a long time ago, it was when I was at Kansas State University and we had farm level data from just under probably close to a thousand farms. And we were able to really look at what drove differences between farms. This was mostly crop farms, but I think the <coughs> conclusion would be the same. And here's what we found. Debt is exactly like you think. It's a two-edged sword, right? People that have high debt either tend to be more profitable or tend to be less profitable. And you think about why that makes sense is people that are profitable, if I can get a 15% return on assets and the bank is borrowing me money, lending me money at 9%, borrowing money is a good thing. On the other hand, if I'm only getting 5% return on assets, Borrowing money is a bad thing, but I'm losing money. I keep borrowing more and more money. So what we found was people that have high leverage tended to be less profitable or more profitable. And it actually makes sense because just looking at their leverage, you don't know why they got to that point. So could I do it with the herds I had? No, because I don't have the individual farm level data. But when I have done it, uh, that can be a good thing or a bad thing, just depending on how how good your return on assets are. All right. Ahmed has another question and what he'd like to know how to calculate maintenance feed costs per cow. Well, what we've done is we basically have kind of went through and looked at the maintenance feed requirements from using like the NRC or what's now NASM and kind of coming back and saying, this is what would be required for a cow. And I know this is kind of crude, but I pretty much, you know, said, you know, for a, for a Holstein cow, we typically say it's going to be about 20 to 22 pounds. That was based on back in my days of working at Kansas State University with Mike Brook and John Smith, and we kind of estimated what it would be uh, for a Holstein cow. So, I mean, but that's the approach you take is walk through with the, sit down to the nutritionist and say, what are the energy requirements just for maintenance? And then we can figure out what's the maintenance required for, for growth and or for milk. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask you to speculate just a little bit as you look into your crystal ball. How do you see the role of carbon credits uh, playing into the future of dairy profitability? Well, I might get myself in a lot of trouble on this one. Uh, and I'm, and I'm going to, this is who I am. So I'm going to tell you some things that some people don't want to hear, but I think this is how I see it. Um, they're going to be just one more factor that's going to speed up consolidation. Because what drives consolidation? What drives consolidation is things that have a big fixed cost, right? Any technology that has a big fixed cost favors people that can spread it over more units. Carbon credits, none of us know for sure where they're going or where it's going to ultimately end up. But we do know that if we start marketing credits, there's a society out there that wants to make sure we're not greenwashing. And because of that, they're going to demand that this is 
close to true as you can with verification, validation, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that is cost. All of that cost favors larger producers because per unit of credit, it helps. So where do I see it going in terms of profitability? I think, I think at some point it might just be table stakes that I have to know this information just to sell my milk. Um, I don't know. Hopefully we won't get there, but it could at some point. Um, so from that standpoint, I don't see people getting really rich off it, but hopefully nobody's really going broke because of it. Mm -hmm. Kind of a follow-up question to that. You talked about uh, herd size is going to favor the larger herds. Today, what would you say is the most profitable herd size? I know you touched a little bit on that in your presentation. And then can you speculate what that might look like again in the future in your crystal ball? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there, there's no such thing as an optimal size. <laughs> well, so here's the, here's the, Here's why it's really hard to answer this, because what's the optimal size dairy in one part of the country is not even remotely the same as another part of the country, right? It, it, it really depends on where you're at, what's, what's your resource base that you're working with. So I don't ever want someone to say that 3,000 cows is the best size, because there's somebody else who'll say, I can do every bit as good with 20,000 cows. And there'll be someone else that says, I can't even do that with three. So there's an optimal size really depends on where you're at, what your land base is, what your environmental footprint is, your conditions. So when we think about what's, in my mind, what's the most optimal is a large parlor that can be used efficiently where cows can come there two or three times a day and still have plenty of time to spend time eating and laying down. So in other words, I can't have a dairy so big, the cows end up walking all day. Mm -hmm. And so then what happens is someone says, okay, that kind of defines a footprint for a parlor. But now somebody might say, what if I just put three, four or five parlors in the same spot? Is that one dairy or is that five dairies? So I think of it kind of as a parlor. And then if you have the ability to put multiple parlors, that makes it look like a bigger herd, but it's still, what's the optimal size for parlor? And that's going to be defined mostly to me by animal welfare in terms of we want a cow to be able to eat and lay down and spend her day not walking all day long to a parlor. Mm -hmm. So that physically constrains how far she can be. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Clayton would like to know, how would you properly evaluate the decision to home raise replacement heifers versus utilizing a custom grower? It's a great question, and it's one that we're a lot of people are struggling with, and a lot of people are trying to do. Uh, so first, if you have the ability to do it, i.e., I've got people, I've got feed, so I mean that's we can get that. That's not an issue. Then we just have to sit down and do some budgeting, and no one loves to do that. People, you know, dairymen like to feed cattle and milk cows. They don't like to sit down and do a bunch of budgets. But you got to sit down and say. If I'm going to compare what it is with custom raising, I have to know what it costs me. And it might be fine that it costs you a little bit more because at the end of the day, my metric is which is producing a better heifer, but I've got to start somewhere. So sit down, do the best job of valuing what your costs are, your time, your resources, and, and then compare that to what the custom would be. All right. Uh, Jim is asking, Culling and heifer replacement had little impact. What is the impact today on the shrinking heifer herd in reference to the industry, as well as impact on herds that overshot their uh, reduction? We're all going to be smart in hindsight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if we know there's going to be some herds out there, and I'm hoping it's not the majority of people that clearly overshot they they went to way too much beef semen and now they don't have enough heifers. What I hope, I suspect all of us want to make sure we don't see is people hanging on to cows that really should have been culled. And now we're milking cows that they're, they're lame, they're crippled because they have no heifers. Okay. And so that's a consequence of not having animals in the pipeline. Um, on the other hand, I think we had more heifers than we needed in the pipeline 
four or five years ago because we overshot with sex semen and we weren't using beef semen yet. Um, so at that point, we had probably way more than we needed. Today, in some cases, we're on a shot. So maybe the percent culling will have a bigger impact on profitability going forward. And maybe at some point we'll come back and change that conclusion that I don't think it's a big factor. I don't think so. I think we'll have some examples where we'll clearly say we should have had a higher call rate. Um, but I, I, I don't know. It's going to be a very, very case specific farm by farm decision. Okay. And that's not a great answer, but that's, I think, just the truth. It's going to be very specific to the farm's situation. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> can you talk a little bit about um, how beef on dairy uh, is impacting the profitability of the U.S. dairy farm? Well, I think <laughs> if I'm not hanging on to cows that really should have been sold six months ago, I think it's been nothing but positive for the dairy industry. But if I sold that really high valued beef on dairy cross heifer or bull, and now I'm milking cows that don't belong in my herd because, but I don't sell them because I have no heifers, then the consequences are negative for the industry. On average right now today, if I had to just pull some number out of my, uh, the crystal ball, I'd say it's been positive. There, I'm sure, are dairies that have negatively been impacted economically because they just literally have no heifers to replace cows with that need to be replaced. On average, right, I don't think well. that's an issue. Okay. You know, I just looked at the clock. We're now 11 minutes yeah. past the top of the hour. Time has flown by. This has been very interesting, Dr. Duvetter. I want to thank you very much for joining us today. I want to thank everyone uh, for attending the webinar as well. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Our Real Science Lecture Series continues with educational topics each month, including Dr. Kevin uh, Harvatine on April 2nd presenting high oleic soybeans, where do they fit into dairy diets? And then we'll have Dr. Uh, Trevor DeVries on May 7th to discuss lessons learned in research on nutritional management of robot milked cows. Visit balchem.com slash real science for details on future webinars and register for upcoming events. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform and search for Real Science Exchange or visit balchem.com slash podcast. Um, if you want a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just subscribe to Real Science Exchange. Send us a screenshot along with your shirt size and address to anh.marketing at balchem.com. We'll get that right, uh, off to you right away. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Duvetter, Thank you for joining us today.